So he had a number of steps, and again, none of these have, there's very little bearing from there to marketing research. There's not even the mention of the word marketing within there. Yeah. So it's refreshing to see that uh, as social media strategy. If you're looking uh, for methodology, it's a very good methodology to take on because of the fact that it has that sense of neutrality there. And when you go on these websites, when you talk with these people, uh, when you engage in their conversations, which is also important to actually engage in their conversations, not just uh, study them for the sake of studying them, but be a part of their world essentially, so they learn to trust you, uh, then you, s you start to see the consumer from a different perspective. So the first part was actually making a control uh, entree, which is actually uh, finding a community, selecting a community, and observing what goes on in that community, and lurking in that community. And lurking was sort of the, is the most common form of gathering data with netnography. So you essentially go there, you listen in on conversations, record what people are saying, and then uh, try and interpret that. You gather and analyze the data, uh, and try to ensure that it's interpreted in a trustworthy uh, manner. Um, you can triangulate the research to do that, and conducting ethical research, and this is where um, my research started to get a little bit crazy because I was researching ethics of consumers, but then I was also having to look at the ethics of the research model itself, so it was a sort of a double ethical uh, issue I had, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in a second. Triangulation is something which hasn't taken place as much recently, so trying to use different methods to prove that your method or what you found is, is correct, uh, so having additional interviews with participants. Uh, more recent ethnographies have not done that. They've relied solely on observation, which suggests that the uh, methodology is becoming uh, more widespread and more accepted as a, a, a trusted uh, way of getting information. But it also suggests people are becoming a bit lazy, possibly, uh, in not triangulating the, triangulating the data. It is an important aspect. So the first form, uh, or the first part, of uh, cultural entree is lurking. So trying to be a observer but not participating in the community. Non-participant observation. Many of us have done this. We've gone onto a, uh, a website and before we've actually commented or we're nervous about maybe writing a comment on there, we sort of look at what everyone else is saying because we don't get bounced from a, a message group by saying the wrong thing. Uh, we look at what everyone else is saying. We try and pick up uh, what the, the general language is and how people interact with one another and then we might make a little comment and then we'll shy away for a few minutes or a, uh, and then make another comment uh, and then eventually you get build up confidence and, and that's the process that you're going through you are in your research going through the process or the motions of a normal member of a community you're not going in there saying let me look at these guys from outside in you're actually saying let me go right inside that community let me go right into uh, that social media site and understand who these people are uh, by becoming one of them. It represents a community member and all of my all of my typologies and community members which, I, which I've used in my research have all come from cultural theory. I don't use uh, marketing theory uh, at all for typologies. I use it as a reference point sometimes but the typologies I find are much better within sociology and anthropology. Uh, and it's been the most commonly used approach for carrying out ethnography, it's just lurking, simply lurking. Just by observing community, you can get a, a good understanding of them. By being there, immersing yourself into that community long enough, you can get a good understanding of them. The problem that we have within uh, this approach is the ethics of it. I do you or do you not seek consent for using somebody's uh, words in your research or trying to interpret their words? Can you do it without their permission? Kozinets argues you can't, or you shouldn't, you can't, you can do whatever you like, but he argues that you shouldn't, and other researchers argue that because it's public media text, you don't need to. What do you guys think? If you're using someone's information online, if you're researching somebody, is it ethical or justifiable, maybe that's a, a slightly easier word for you to um, justify what your response might be, uh, is it justifiable to not tell somebody you're researching them online? Yes? I suppose if they have already agreed to uh, 
certain amount of sharing of their information. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, with the terms and conditions of Facebook, if they've agreed that everything on their timeline mm -hmm. is viewable, then the idea that they should be upset that somebody's then viewing it and making assessments about them would mm -hmm. seem a little out of place, perhaps. Okay, and that's exactly the same argument that Langer and Beckman use. They say, well, these people have agreed that they're going to be on this public forum and use, and so, so therefore using their information, is, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But there is a reason why I would recommend telling people that you are researching them. And it goes into an actual practical reason. And again, this comes from knowledge of ethnography. Now, marketers generally are seen by people who are non-marketers as a little bit corrupt and evil and uh, uh, trying to get out money and not very nice people. Right? It's one of the reasons why I don't refer to myself as a marketer all the time, because uh, it gives a negative impression. Uh, so, so that perception is out there. Uh, and it's out there for a reason, because a, a lot of the time what marketers do is very, very borderline. You know, It is borderline to, as we were talking about before, uh, get a 60-page A4 document uh, which no one's going to read and ask people to agree to the terms and conditions on that. Within those terms and conditions, there's bound to be something which you don't like. Right? It's impossible for there not to be. So, with that in mind, I, I looked at some, and I, and I spoke to a colleague actually um, at the University of Essex, who said it's really important to tell people that you are researching them. Because that way you can go through this process of member checking. So, how do you know what you've written about somebody is correct? How do you know that you've interpreted it in the right way? In other words, is your research valid? Now, obviously, the viewpoint used by Langer and Beckman, if you can justify it, fine, you're okay with it. But I'm just representing uh, the viewpoint which, which I have based on... Uh, and and this, this sort of story uh, will probably help to cement it, maybe. Uh, this individual, he was, uh, he was doing an ethnography within a, an actual uh, a business. So he actually went into a, a real-life business, not an internet business. And he started observing uh, what goes on there and making notes about what people do. And there was this one instant where, where the, uh, the, work, the employees were watching this video. And uh, apparently it was quite an uh, emotional sort of a, a video because it, it, was, it was for a charity or something. And then uh, some of the, the scenes within there were quite disturbing. And he saw one, uh, one lady who sort of had her head, head in her hands and she looked quite distressed by what she was seeing. And so he, he, he noted that down, uh, that she was distressed by what she saw. And he was going to use that to reflect what her character was. And uh, I think after that, or the next day, he went to, uh, to see her and he said, can you check over what I've written here? Because I've written this, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that you looked distressed yesterday because of what you saw. And she read what he had written, and she said, don't be daft, I had a hangover from the night before. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we know what we are interpreting is the actuality? We need to check with those members. Yes, there's a possibility that they will then try and present themselves in a more positive light. Uh, and that's sort of the criticism of member checking, that people are going to, if they see something negative, they'll be against that. But then here's where the issue of trust comes in. Yeah? If you are in a community for a long enough period of time, if you're, uh, I'd assume that you've, you've made some pretty good friendships over here where you can talk to one another and you can tell each other the, the truth, whether it's positive or negative. The same applies to a netnography. If you are actually becoming a part of that community and they learn to trust you, then they will be quite positive towards you. That's how the theory goes with, with uh, Cosnets anyway. The interesting thing, and the reason I put this section here, is because Langer and Beckman, who in the previous slide I said, uh, don't necessarily prescribe to member checking and disclosure, uh, actually talk about, this is something which was a presentation from what Beckman did. She said the researcher should take a cautious position on the private versus public medium uh, issue. So in the presentation she was a little bit for it, and maybe I'm sort of trying to have a go at Beckman here. Um, for having a double standard, because when she's presenting about netnography, she talks about the importance of seeking and obtaining permission, whilst in the actual netnography, which she did on cosmetic surgery, her argument was it's a sensitive issue, uh, and that's why we did it slightly covertly. So just a twofold.